All right, Rangers hot. I'm joining the militia soon, apparently. I'm being drafted. That goes over your neck. This hand here, this hand here, muzzle down. Muzzle down. You will start at the top of the hill up there. I'm slightly shooting my pants right now. I have not really ran around with an assault rifle before. Not to mention, he just kind of gave it to me and said, have at her. You'll run down here, and this is the first position. You're laying fire. What we're trying to test is that when you're running through here and you get in your position, you're going to go. You're breathing hard, your heart rate's up, and your rifle's going. And you're going, uh-oh, I got to control my breathing, and then I got to control my aim, and now I got to shoot. Already fucked up. Already a bad soldier. It's not Al-Qaeda. It's the American militia. Why did I join the militia? Yeah. Because I think the power, the wealth, and the land have been taken from the American people. Do you like the federal government? Do I like the federal government? No, yeah. I do not. You do not? I do not. I've been a survivalist all my life, camper, outdoorsman. And I'm sitting home watching the news, and Janet Napolitano came on the TV and said that returning veterans and right-wing militias were more dangerous to the United States than Al-Qaeda, and a light went off. Right-wing militias, Michigan militia. I had forgotten all about them. Went on the internet, contacted my Wayne County contact, a couple dinners, a couple meetings, and I've been with them ever since. That was 2010. Ben, Six. you're in the safest place in America right now. <laughs> I, I swear to God. Security issue. Always bring the to wherever you go. January 2016. A standoff between government authorities and a militia in Oregon comes to a deadly climax. A roadblock is breached, and one of the militia members is killed. From the outset, that militia didn't seem to present a clear and present danger to America's security. They were a group of American citizens, armed but not considered dangerous. But by the end of the occupation, the tone had changed. Citizen militias represented a renewed threat to the homeland. Some blame the surge on a president who's bent on gun control. Every single year, more than 30,000 Americans have their lives cut short by guns. And a presidential candidate who's tapping into fear and anger across America. And everybody that we ship over, if I win, is going back. I'm sorry. No, I'm going back. They're going back. Whatever the reason, some say militias have grown by as much as 40% in 2016 alone. As a Canadian, even the idea of a militia and guys wearing camouflage Open carrying guns and talking anti-government rhetoric is totally insane. So I had to see it for myself. The best place to learn more was visiting one of the original and most famous militias of all, the Michigan militia. We found them armed and in all places, a crowded family eatery in the suburbs of Detroit. Oh my God, that's good wide air shit right there. It is, uh, well, it's even bigger than that. <laughs> you do want to shoot it two-handed. Oh yeah. It looks like a big boy toy. You can please stand and face the flag. And uncover. And uncover. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The night was a one-stop shop for interested new members, but was also a way for the militia to spread the word about issues like Flint, Michigan's water crisis and wider concerns over Syrian refugees arriving in Detroit. Once you get seated, there's a, a sort of a 
couple of handouts we give out as a new person handout, if you could let us know, and our, our CQ runner, Chris, will deliver the items to you. My name is Lee. I'm the coordinator of the SMVM. Uh, this is our monthly public meeting. Well, we're the Southeast Michigan Volunteer Militia, and it's a local group of citizens who prepare to um, defend the community against crime, invasion, disaster, terrorism, and tyranny. So uh, we're just uh, prepared citizens. Lee Mirko was a member of the original Michigan militia in the 90s when it reportedly had 10,000 members. Yeah, I have my Glock, Glock holster. You got a Glock? Oh, yeah, Glock 17. This is Grace. This is so cool, the cool thing. I bought this in California, and I only paid like three ninety or two ninety seven for it. And this is one of how many guns you own? Oh, um, I don't know, 20. 20? I think I peaked out at 24, but I've gotten rid of a few. <laughs> so. Do you ever just lay them out on one like massive oh, table yeah, yeah, and just yeah. shoot we them have... all one by one? No, I don't, no, that's, because a lot of them are 12 gauge and, and you know, they're the same caliber. I, mean, I would be going through a lot of ammo. Cool. Well, then more about this. Last night I was I was reading the I read your the pamphlet and had a lot of interesting points on what happened since the last meeting. One of them was uh, Syrian refugees and how rural communities are being overburdened by them. What's the what's the deal with that? Well, you, the the problem with that, first of all, first of all, if your country is in a civil war, you stay there and fight. Okay. You don't leave uh, old people and little kids and women behind. It's tough, though, because these groups, you know, you're facing people that are cutting people's heads off, leaving them in the streets. Do you really want to face that every day? That's exactly who you want to fight. Who more than that? Who else are you going to fight other than the monsters in your street? If you've heard of the Michigan militia before, it's probably because of this man, Timothy McVeigh. He attended some of their meetings. That was before he set off a massive truck bomb at a federal building in Oklahoma City in 1995 that killed 168 people. We have come back from Oklahoma City. I wouldn't say that there's 10 or 12,000 of us across the state, but here's the thing, we don't know. There used to be one group, the Michigan Militia, and now they're 15, 10, 15, 20. A lot has changed in Michigan and across America since the days of Timothy McVeigh. Whether it's fear, politics, or economic despair, something is feeding the militia movement once again. If there's anyone who understands why, it's Joellen Vineyard. Hi, I'm Ben. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. She's a professor of history at Eastern Michigan University who spent a lot of time with the Michigan militia when she was writing a book about them. A lot of them are ex-military men, and, and they see themselves as a paramilitary organization. They see themselves as a militia, harking back to the days of, you know, the colonial militia and getting their authority from the early, um, you know, constitutional era. And so it's part of their, their persona. So they're armed, and what do they want? would talk about these overarching things. They don't like the United Nations. They don't like WTO. They don't like NAFTA. But what don't they really like? What's really making them mad is some cop who's hassling them, some tax collector who's unfairly assessed their land, some judge who's made the fathers pay too much alimony. You know, they go to church, they keep the law, they send their kids to school but they still get screwed. Flint, for example, you can see why they would be really angry right now. Their water has been polluted. The militia might represent a marginalized social class, but are they inherently violent? We've seen this in Michigan before. In 2010, the FBI raided a Christian militia group. It was plotting armed conflict against the police. But Lee Miracle says they are different. The training is about preventing terrorism and tyranny not stoking it. I head to Northern Michigan where some of the militia are training for something. I just feel like at any moment there's gonna be guys that are gonna pop up out of the woods. Why is it all quiet? Their enemies are out. 
So when she just woke up, and now we're making our way towards the first exercise. We're in single file, and everyone's got their guns, they're ready to go. We're gonna be doing some ski pole shooting. But it's interesting because we stop every once in a while, make sure that the enemy doesn't know where we are, and we're vigilant. It's okay, just let it go, and we'll come back. All right. That's how you do it. Use the sled as your cover. Remember, around the back of it. Oh, back? Yep, remember? Using the sled as cover. That's it. So even today, mm -hmm. right now, and even yesterday, we're seeing there's new people showing up and wanting to join this militia. Why now? What are, why are these new recruits so interested? What's driving that? There's a number of reasons. First of all, you have ISIS, and groups like ISIS making a splash across the world. Um, we have a large number of Middle Eastern immigrants in this area, not up here, but I mean in Metro Detroit where we're at. Dearborn. So people see the likelihood of possible terrorist actions as a possibility in, in our lives. So it's people want to prepare for that. They see what happened in Paris and think that something like that could have been cut down and or prevented by armed citizens who are trained to use what they carry. Oh, bitch. And this is one of your old World War I guns, right? Yes, World War I, World War II. This was manufactured in 1937. You can find them just about anywhere, from like your local sporting goods stores to uh, 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 to your, your higher-end gun dealers. You guys have yeah. like almost the SVT? Yeah. Yes, the SVT-40. Yeah. Yeah. You can get them for what, 300 bucks up there? Yeah. yeah. You're <laughs> jealous of Canadian guns? Yes, I am. I've said <laughs> this many, many, many times. I want an SVT. So the militia tell me they're training for everything from ISIS to an ice storm to Flint. But the fact is, most of the militias in America were in response to two events. Ours sprung up after Ruby Ridge and Waco and what people perceived as the government stepping in heavy-handedly and killing citizens, which is something I think we need to be concerned about. Ruby Ridge and Waco were both armed standoffs that basically kick-started the militia movement in 1993, two years before Timothy McVeigh's Oklahoma City bombing. The Waco standoff is what really did it. That was when federal agents tried to seize the guns belonging to a religious cult leader named David Koresh. It ended with the FBI raiding his ranch and starting a fire that killed Koresh and 75 of his followers. The biggest issue with the militia is always the Second Amendment, because while we have the ability to say what we want, without the Second Amendment to back up the first, we can get run down real fast. So I came here, 23 years later, to try and find out what these guys are actually training for this time. But before I know it, they insisted on training me. Run down here, and this is the first position. You're laying fire. Your partner, he's gonna run down the hill, tap you on the shoulder, then he's gonna squat and provide defensive position for you behind you. Make sure you have at least two bullets left when you get the tap on the shoulder. You lay off your last two rounds, and then you move to the next position. Where's the fucking target? I'm not seeing it. Clear. After training, the militia unwind exactly how you think they do. By shooting some guns, more guns, and then some bigger guns. Oh, you weren't ready that time, were you? No, I was not. All right, I'm good. <laughs> 
Eventually, it's time to retreat for the night into the woods. If you are an American citizen and you are able-bodied and you are capable of bearing arms, you are the militia. If something so horrible was to happen, this is the days that you will see, you know, the most harshest of anti-gun individuals picking up a rifle and fighting along, alongside each other. Like, let's say, God forbid, Chinese communists drop out of the sky for whatever fucking reason. You worried about something like that? <sighs> Am I? That's a possibility. There's always a possibility of anything happening. We live in a very strange world. I don't think anybody can disagree with that. Is America afraid? No, well, it's not just Americans, it's the whole world. Everybody's afraid. Everybody has their fears or something. When you take on a family, you're responsible to defend that family. You're, their lives are in your hands. So if somebody breaks into your house, attempts to do whatever it is they're in your house to do, it's your obligation to stop them. Not necessarily kill them, just stop them. I've specifically bought weapons that fired or were the same as the government owned. Why that if, choice? If the shit ever hit the fan, there should be lots of government ammunition floating around. And I wanted weapons that would shoot it. When you say shit hits the fan, what do you mean by that? The government? Anarchy, riots, who knows? And the government in that situation, could they be the enemy? That's feasible. I don't think the government need fear us at all. No? Other than if they stick their nose out just a little bit too far. I'm 57 years old. They start mass gun confiscation, and they come to my house I can't guarantee their safety. Historically, groups that have been armed, what good have they done? Um, it's hard to make a case for arming of people who are afraid and who don't trust each other. It's, it's dangerous for them to be armed because they can misperceive an action, I think. Um, it makes them feel safer, but in the end, I, I think it makes them much less safe. I heard a lot of scary things about the Michigan militia before I came down here. The interesting thing is we actually just found a bunch of dudes in the woods playing militia, shooting their guns, and acting like army men. But the one thing we knew for sure was that this type of group, they're not alone. They're all over America. And the insane thing is, they're only growing. Some of those exact same types of groups, they're pretty dangerous. No one can say how big the militia movement is in America, or what it will do next. That has people here on Capitol Hill concerned. Keith Ellison represents Minnesota's fifth congressional district. He's the first Muslim elected to Congress and also grew up in Michigan. These days, he's leading the fight to reopen a little-known branch of Homeland Security. It was called the Office of Extremism. Now, you're lobbying for the DHS to reopen their Office of Extremism. Yes. Why? Because I think that what we don't know, we cannot protect ourselves from. I mean, these are people who believe the government is out to harm them. They say so. And I just think it makes sense to uh, allow them their First Amendment rights by all means, all their rights, but at the same time be aware of what kind of threat they might represent. Some of the guys I met, you know, I'll be honest, there wasn't very much color among them. Yeah. They were primarily white guys, but they were up in the woods, they had air 15s, they had high powered weapons. Yeah, these are white guys in the woods in rural communities. There's nobody, they, they, there's no Mexicans taking their job, there's no Mexicans. There's no African-Americans taking their job. There's no African-Americans. Who are they afraid of? I, what I find fascinating, and I can't give you the answer for, is why they're so hostile, so violent, and so paranoid. I don't get it. I don't get that, and I can't tell you why. If you get a bunch of black guys together, the label gang will be slapped on them pretty fast. If you get a bunch of Muslim guys together, the label terrorists, We'll get that label will get slapped on them pretty fast. You get a but a similarly you get a bunch of white guys in similar age and description doing the same thing, then the, the 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 red flags that go up will be a lot slower, maybe too slow, 
And as a result of that, some people who need help don't get it. Some people who are truly dangerous don't get prevented. And that's my take on it. What if he's written the letters, he's done all that, but he's gotten nowhere? Because a lot of Americans and a lot of militiamen, that's kind of how they sounded. They felt hopeless. Well, you know what? In Washington, D.C. today, there are people marching all over, demanding that we have a more democratic society to get money out of politics. There is a nonviolent, peaceful movement to democratize our country. Join them. Join these people who, who know and understand that, that, that elevating the people's voice in this government, which is supposed to be of, by, and for the people, can be done if you join with other Americans. Some from the city, some from the country, some from the burbs, black, white, brown, all colors, different faith communities. Join with other people to help revitalize democracy in America. But going to get some bullets, that ain't going to do nothing. That's not going to help. You're not going to change anything.